There was a uh, mega church pastor out in Colorado. His last name was Haggard. I, and I want to say his name was Larry Haggard or Ted Haggard. I knew two different preachers whose last name was Haggard. One of them was Ted, one of them was Larry. But uh, this guy was a mega church pastor. And um, I remember that after September 11th, when um, we were contemplating going to war against Iraq because they had weapons of mass nothing, um, that this mega church pastor Haggard, he had, a, he had built some kind of prayer center. And people would go and pray, and they'd, sometimes they'd stay there for 24 hours and pray and whatever. But he made a, a statement. He said, God woke him up in the middle of the night and said these words to him. If you can get one million people to pray about this pending war in Iraq, then I promise you no American lives will be lost in this. God told him that. So he put that out on social media. Uh, whatever was around back then. Blogs and websites and so on. And I saw it. And I went, uh, 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 I'm not buying that. Well, all of a sudden, if you remember, the bombs started dropping in Iraq. And explosions and gunfire. And then we started seeing these American flag-draped coffins returning from Iraq. Soldiers that had been killed. So I wrote to... Uh, I couldn't find Pastor Haggard's email address, but I, I found the, the person who was in charge of the prayer center, and I wrote him an email, and I said, it, it is known, and I quoted the source, that Pastor Haggard said that if we could get a million people to pray, that God would bless and that no American lives would be lost. I said, now I'm seeing coffins coming back from the Middle East full of dead American soldiers. And I, and I asked the question, what happened? Was Pastor Haggard wrong? Or could he not get a million people to pray that no lives would be lost? And the guy just kind of deflected the question and said, I'm not the one who made that statement. That was Pastor Haggard's statement. You will have to contact him. In other words, I don't, I'm not going to answer it. I'm not going to deal with it. And so he deflected it and didn't want to deal with it because he knew it was a lie. Well, not too long after that, I'm trying to find this Pastor Haggard's email address or contact information somehow, some way. But I found out he was busy at the time being arrested and dealing with hiring male prostitutes who were he was using to purchase methamphetamine for him. Man was a sodomite and a meth head. He did not hear from God. And even if I didn't find out about his, and of course, you know, naturally he lost his church and his reputation and everything like that. Even if I didn't find out about all that, all I have to know is that he was wrong one time when he spoke in the name of the Lord. He, he, he was a false prophet because he was wrong one time. That's all it takes. According to Deuteronomy 18, he was wrong that one time. So I, people, I will tell you, be careful 
What you hear, and especially when it comes out of a preacher's mouth, somebody's, oh, wait a minute, that's me. Be doubly careful what you hear coming out of a preacher's mouth. Uh, 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 John chapter 11. Here I am in Isaiah 11. John chapter 11. Uh, this is Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. And we've done a little study on resurrection and, and so on. God, and, and just, boy, think, just think about it. Our whole religion, our entire religion, hinges on the fact that God brings dead things back to life. Amen. And he does it in, in a multitude of ways. He's not just referring to the end of our life and how that we're going to live again at, you know, at the, at the last day. God's going to resurrect everybody and we're going to live again at the last day. God resurrects lots of things. He brings life back in. He'll, he'll take a dead church and breathe life into it. He's done it with this one. He'll take dead preachers and breathe new life back into him. He's done it with me. God will take dead relationships, dead marriages, situations where people are at, you know, at odds with one another and that relationship has died off, but God can bring those things back together again. I've seen it happen and God is good at what he's doing. And I'll say this, there's a constant theme in all the scriptures. If you look at it, when God brings something back to life or he resurrects or something is born again, the second time is always better than the first time. Think of, think of your first birth. Your first birth, you were brought into this world with violence. Whap! They don't do that anymore. I think they should. Just to let them know, somebody's boss now. Okay? But your first life is nowhere near as good as your second life is. Even though we're not in heaven yet, we have a much better life now in Christ that we had before we were saved. Oh, you can't deny that. And that's just how it is. He, the earth, and I was talking about a while ago, if you've never just taken a walk and looked at trees and looked at grass and flowers and watched nature and looked at the stars at night and looked at rivers going down, if you've never done anything like that and, and just thought of God putting all of that in motion and, and, and just had a time with God, I'm not a... They, they call it uh, pantheism or something like that, where they say God is in everything. I don't believe everything is God, but I believe that God can be seen in everything that he made. Romans chapter 1 tells us that very plainly. And I love that. But as beautiful as this world is, God's got a better one waiting for us. A new heaven and a new earth. And the old heaven and the old earth are going to pass away. There's going to be no more sea. The New Testament is better than the Old Testament. Somebody say amen. So we have now Lazarus. He's alive. He's brand new again. And so in John chapter 11 verse 43, when he had thus spoken... He cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. And why wouldn't they? They witnessed the resurrection Somebody who they knew was dead and had been dead for four days. Mary and Martha warned Jesus that by rolling that stone away, his, his odor is going to come out of that cave. And I'm positive that it did. And everybody around there probably got a whiff of a four-day-old dead body. And it's bad. It's horrible. They knew he was dead, and yet now he comes out walking alive. And as they're taking all of those wrappings and linens off of him and seeing him alive, not in a state of corruption like he looked five minutes ago, 
but in this beautiful state of being brand new again. They believed and, and they said, we're going to follow Jesus the rest of our life. And, I, and just think about it. If, if, if Jesus were to come today, Go to some graveyard somewhere, some cemetery. Speak to the grave. And all of a sudden, somebody that had been dead 50 years, 75 years, came up out of that grave looking like they were 30 years old again. And that would be published all over the world via the Internet. How many people do you think would be followers of Jesus right then and there? This is the Son of God here. Who else can do something like that? Well, that isn't quite how it happened here. Now, many of the Jews which came to Mary had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. But verse 46, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Now, I don't understand that. I don't understand it. In my lifetime, being in church, I have seen God take the worst people in the world and make them a brand new person. I've seen it. I've seen it with me. I've seen it with my brother-in-law, Steve. Man, you should have known him. Well, no. And I remember the night I preached Steve's funeral. There was a man that had come. And I don't, I don't know how he knew Steve. But he came and, and I shared that testimony of how Steve had come to the Lord. And how just five days before he came to my office and asked me. How, I, I, I just want to make sure I'm going to heaven when I die. And he said that he had been talking to some police officers down in Bon Terre where Steve was living. Apparently, Steve had a name and a reputation down there. And those cops were going, did you hear about Steve Leonard? Yeah, he died in his sleep the other night. And he said, some of them were going, oh, I bet I know, I wonder where he is right now. And the guy said, after hearing what you said, I'm going to go back to those cops and I want to tell them I know where he is right now. And he's not in hell like they think. He's in heaven. Because God made a difference in that man's life. I remember Keith Crum, Brady and Bradley's dad. The reason why Brady and Bradley always had so much problems Getting, getting religion down, getting the right one is because their mom and dad never took them anywhere to church. And at times there was some pretty bad blood between those two boys and their parents. Once they got things right, I remember they called me over to the hospital. We got dad in the ER. He's not doing well. He's choking up blood and things that we were afraid. Pastor, would you come over here? I went over there, was in the ER with him for a while, and they said, we're going to do some tests on him, meet him up in the room. And when, we, when me and the boys left, I told Brady and Bradley, I said, you guys go get some lunch. I said, when they bring your dad up to the room, I'm going to talk to him, but I want it to be just me and him. And so they took off, and I waited outside his room, and finally they wheeled Keith in. And you know how when they bring somebody to a room after being in the ER or surgery, you know, it takes forever for them to get everything hooked up. and everything. It just seemed like they brought him in and did a couple things and they were out. And that left me and him in that room all alone. And, and in 10 minutes time, I explained the gospel to Keith Crumb. I said, Keith, would you like to give your life to Jesus Christ right now? And he said, yes, I would. And the man got saved right then and there. And I mean, not five minutes after that, the doctor came in and said, Keith, You've got cancer. It's from here down. There's probably not much we're going to be able to do about it. In other words, he was told he was going to die. But that man was saved. And, and three days later, they laid him out of the hospital. Bradley calls me and says, Mikey, you got to hear this. I said, what? He said, we picked up dad. We were taking him to go get his, his medication. And he said, on the way over to the pharmacy, he's sitting in the car going, Boys, I don't know what it is, but I just feel like I got somebody living inside of me. 
And I started laughing. They said, what are you laughing at? I said, it took you boys years to figure that out. He's been a Christian three days and he already knows it. And I'll tell you what, God made a difference in that man's life. Changed his heart. He was a dead man that God brought back to life. And when you see that happen enough, you believe that this thing is real. This thing is real. What does it take for some people to watch a four-day-old dead man walk out of a tomb and hate the man who did it? What does it take? That's part of that. I, I may pick back up on that this Sunday, preaching about power and the people who hold power. And it's just something I don't comprehend what people get out of ruling over somebody. And, and it's a drug that they can never get enough of. I don't understand it. But these men, verse 46, some of them went their ways. Who did they go to? The Pharisees. Now, let me explain something. The, the two groups of Jewish theologians back in those days, who can tell me what, who they were? Pharisees and the Sadducees. And what was the main difference between them? Resurrection. The Pharisees believed in a resurrection, but the Sadducees didn't. Notice that these guys did not go to the Sadducees. They went to the Pharisees. And these are men who apparently believe that the power of resurrection rests in their hands. In other words, do what we tell you to do. Um, turn to Matthew 23. Do what we tell you to do. Jim Jones said that, didn't he? Remember Jim Jones? This is before some of you young people's times, but I remember it. Matthew 23. Look at what Jesus said. Verse 1, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. These Pharisees, they loved having power over people. Jim Jones, what he wanted was power. And maybe, maybe it was because he liked what it could provide for him. Jim Jones had control of all the money. Maybe he liked money. Jim Jones was, no doubt in my mind, probably sleeping with a lot of the women in that cult. David Koresh, the Branch Davidian compound, we know for a fact, that David Koresh, whenever a married couple would come in and join his cult, he would say to the husbands, you can no longer be with your wife. That role belongs to me now. And David Koresh slept with every woman that he wanted to in that compound, including 13-year-old girls. They would have a marriage ceremony. He would marry them have a marriage ceremony, and he would be married, quote-unquote, to 12- and 13-year-old girls in that compound. Maybe that's the power. Maybe he liked what the power brought him, that he could do these things and didn't have to hide it with the people in that cult because he had power over them. He told Those people had every opportunity to leave that compound um, there's been several books written by some of the survivors. There was a series that was put out, I think, on Netflix. And I watched it, and it, I think it's 
fairly accurate because it was written by one of the survivors. But those people had the opportunity to leave, but they were told by David Koresh, if you walk out that door, you can kiss heaven goodbye because you're not going. And he held that power over those people and it cost them their lives and cost them their souls too. So that, that kind of power stuff, I, I don't understand it, but that's what's at play here. Jesus has now done something that the fame of it, it's like putting a picture on the internet and then the next day you realize that Something in it is bad and you take it down, but is it gone? Not on the internet. You cannot clean, you cannot scrub the internet of something. It's, it, if it's there, it's going to stay there. And this thing here, the Pharisees know that there is no way in the world that everybody's going to keep quiet about this. And what are they afraid of? They're going to lose their power. So in verse 47... Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees uh, a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. Now, stop right there. I, I got I to gotta go to this verse. Go to Psalm 2. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. Do you believe in conspiracies? I didn't say conspiracy theories. I said, do you believe in conspiracies? Yes. The Bible will reveal all the conspiracies to you. Not theories, facts. When you look at Psalm 2, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And it says specifically in verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. That is called a conspiracy. In a court of law, the, it's, le it's a legal term that, let's say that, um, let's say that Derek was going to rob the gas station down here, okay, and um, beat up the gas station attendant and steal all the money. If he does it all by himself and doesn't tell anybody, then it's solely on him. But if he pulls JR into it and says, JR, I need your help. I'm going to go down this gas station and rob it. I'm going to beat the clerk up. And I'll split the money with you if you just watch out to see, make sure no cops are coming by. Okay? Now, all JR is doing is standing out on the street watching for cops. But is he part of that crime? And if somebody gets killed in that, J.R. is going to go down for murder because he was linked to that crime by means of conspiracy to commit this crime. Wrong time. That's John Coke. Here, take my phone. Hurry, 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 hurry. There you go. Her air conditioner's been out. We've called one company. They haven't been out in two days now. Two days they haven't come out. So I said, well, I'm going to call my guy. So now he calls. So anyway. Uh, but anyway, that's what a conspiracy is. JR is guilty by way of conspiracy. He consented to it and participated in it, even though he didn't rob the guy, he didn't kill the guy, he didn't do anything like that. He is still part of it by way of conspiracy. Okay, and that's, what's, that's what you see in Psalm chapter 2. The kings of the earth and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That is a conspiracy. All it takes is two or more people to be part of it. And in this case here, you, look, notice the language of John eleven forty seven. 47. Then gathered the chief priest and the Pharisees a council. They had a secret meeting. And they all agreed that Jesus must die. 
even though they never drove the nails, they never arrested him, they never, they weren't the ones that whipped him, they're not the ones who scourged him, they're not the ones who beat him in the face, plucked his beard, spat on him, they're not the ones who did that. They are just as guilty as anybody else. Look in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Thank you, Lord. This is good. I didn't plan on going this way with it, but I think God wants us to understand something. Just hang on to it. Um, in, in Romans chapter 1, you look at verse... 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And this is why I have said, and I've had people leave this church over that. I say, if you vote for somebody who is in favor of killing pre-born children, you are just as guilty as the doctor who cut them up. And I won't, I didn't apologize to the guy. I won't apologize to the guy that left. He was... He was a deacon here. But his union told him who to vote for. And, I, and I'm just going, how, how can you reconcile that in your heart where you are voting for someone who you know is going to vote for pro-sodomite weddings, vote for abortion rights, and, and be that crooked, how can you do that? That makes them, according to the scripture, part of the conspiracy. It is a conspiracy to commit murder. It is a conspiracy to um, be part of what God calls an abomination. That is, a man lying with another man as with a woman. God said that is an abomination. And God gave this whole list of things here that a person's not to do. And yet, if you consent with them in their doing it, you are, in God's eyes, as guilty as they are. And even in earthly courts in this country, you can be guilty of a crime without ever lifting a finger by way of being part of the conspiracy that links you with it. That's what I, when Matthew was, he was going to, he was coming in in the carpenter's union. And um, he come home excited one day. He said, Dad, oh my goodness. At lunchtime, the, the business agents, union reps came around and he said, I looked out and he said, there's just food everywhere. They had barbecue, they had the sodas and they had all this food out here. Man, they're feeding us well. And then they had a little deal about, you know, the election coming up. And I said, son, I don't mind you being in the union. Everybody's got to have a job. Some unions, some jobs are just union jobs. Do not let them tell you who to vote for. And I know for a fact, uh, Bill Federer is going to be here in, in August as part of the Southwest Radio. Bill's a great guy. But Bill ran against Richard Gebhardt back in the 90s. And that was when Gebhardt was our representative in, in the House of Representatives in Washington. And uh, Bill Federer said that he knew for a fact that some of the unions the union reps was driving to all their union members' houses to see if they had a Gebhardt sign in their front yard. And if they didn't, they sat at home and didn't work. That's wicked. It's evil. And I think, it, I think there's no doubt in my mind that a lot of these union guys in 2016 said, Hillary's not going to be my president. I don't care what the union says. Okay, 
Uh, and they probably said it again, too, a couple years ago, but I can't talk about that. So anyway, uh, let me finish reading this. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we, uh, what do we, for this man doeth many miracles. Uh, uh, what are they, stupid? He's, he, ro he raised, anybody who could raise a man from the dead, do you really think you can beat him? No. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. You see it? They're losing their power base. And they can't have that happen. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them named Caiaphas. He's a bad guy, but he's the high priest. Being the high priest that same year said unto them, Watch the language of your King James Bible. Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Now Caiaphas said that in absolute ignorance, Chris. But when you look at the statement, Caiaphas was saying exactly what Jesus did. One man will die so that the rest of the nation can live. Hey, man, that's what he said. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he, he, Caiaphas, this evil man, prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Doubt it not, people. Doubt it not that God still knows who are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He knows who they are. And he sent, he sent Jesus. Did Jesus come to this earth as a Chinaman? A Russian? An African? A European? A, God forbid, French? No! A Jew. A Jew. Why? To die for his own people. And I've had somebody else leave this church over that issue who wanted to tell me and wanted permission to tell everybody in the church that we have replaced Israel. And I said, you're not going to do that here. Well, he left. So anyway, verse 52, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. That means the rest of us. One man dying so that the rest of us can live forever. Amen? And so, think about it now. You're plotting to kill a man who can raise dead people back to life. How logically, if you think this through logically, Sister Helen, how is that going to work out now? If you do kill him, what's going to happen? He's going to get over it. He's going to walk it off. Amen. He's going to come back from the dead and live. And that is exactly what happened. Amen.